Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today it is the 24th of March. Today we're covering the latest updates on the Avdivka and Ivanivske fronts. And we'll look at the Ukrainian strikes on Crimea and the Russian strikes on Western Ukraine. And as you can see on my map, in yellow, I've added in a file which shows the Ukrainian defensive positions all across the country, including on the front line, but also on the rear. So it's really cool. And as you can see on the map within the Russian lines, you have Ukrainian fortifications that were built before the Russians advanced. So hopefully that clears up any confusion about the yellow color. And of course, it's not my work on the Russian side, which is like the green color or the white color that's adjacent to it. Those are fortifications that were mapped out using satellite imagery from Project Owl Osint. And then the yellow fortification map, you could see that was made by Clement Moline. So of course, all credit goes to them. They did a really impressive job. And it's going to be a really useful tool to overlay on the front line map as we look at certain parts of the front line, such as Avdivka right now. And so, according to reporting from Deep State, the Russian forces continued to advance in the fields to the west of the villages that they recently captured, including Tolenke, where the Russian forces advanced 1.5 kilometers westwards. This is verified again by Deep State mapping, but also by these geolocated videos showing the Ukrainian resistance mainly consisting of drones. For instance, this FPV hit a Russian tank as it was operating west of Tonenke. And there's similar videos from the Shadow Drone Unit, which is a unit that's mainly been operating around Novomi Kalivka and Marinka, but they do have a presence around Avdivka now as well. And so they're going to drop grenades into uh, the hatches of the tanks and destroy one of them near Tonenke. And again, this is the way, one of the ways that we verify the gradual expansion of Russian presence through these fields. And then there's another video which is from the Lumir group, which is the drone group of the 2nd Battalion of the 3rd Assault Brigade, which shows various FPV strikes on the positions of Russian infantry as they are advancing through the dirt roads from Mostochkinia into Orlivka. And then the last video shows targeting of a house within Orlivka, which again is further proof that the Russian forces are turning Orlivka into a forward operating base from which they plan to launch further attacks westwards across the Durna River and towards Ukrainian defensive line. Additionally, to the north, Deep State reported on a one kilometer advance of the Russian side, just to the south of Berdichi and towards the Durna River. And so they're clearing out a lot of the gray zone in those open fields. And of course, the Ukrainians are targeting those vehicles as they make their way through those open areas. And so you had the Third Assault Brigade, their FPVs targeted an abandoned Russian BMP-3. And two ATVs, we're seeing a lot of these ATVs being used to transport Russian quick, uh, Russian troops quickly from place to place on the Avdivka front. And then, of course, the downside is that even though they're mo more mobile and cheap, that they're way more exposed and not well protected. And lastly, on Berdichi, Deep State again reports the Russians trying to establish control over the parallel road running along this red arrow to go along with the first role that they captured in southern Brudici, but so far they claim to have repelled those attacks. What we're seeing, the most interesting development, is the fact that the Russian forces got control over additional fields to the west of Tolenke. These fields are located on the local height in the region because there is a minor hill that runs in the section of the front line where I'm uh, going over with these red lines. And that overlooks generally all of the river valleys in the region because there's a lot of valleys that are formed by the gullies that I'm marking in green over here that go through Omanske, for instance, and Yasno Brodivka, the Talovke to the south, and Provomyske. And so generally, this entire semicircle where, that I'm going over in green and the nearby fields are located on a, a local depression in comparison to the hill in the center with the red lines. And so that's the vector where the Russians are currently pushing through. And it's also the same region where the Ukrainians set up their defenses over the past few months in preparation for a Russian attack from the southern flank, as I detailed in my last video. But now the Russians are attacking from the eastern flank, and they are in the process of currently overrunning those Ukrainian positions. So it'll be interesting to see whether the Ukrainians try to resist in those pre-planned defenses, or whether they gradually pull back to the green lines where you have these troop clusters around Umanske, for instance, where the Ukrainians do have a pretty sizable defensive node marked in this red rectangle over here and along this road in particular where there are some Ukrainian defenses being built.
Now moving on to the Bakhmut front, you could say, but shifting towards Chasi VR. It was claimed by the Russian MOD yesterday that they took control over the entirety of Ivanivsky. So far, there's no geolocated footage from the western section confirming a Russian advance. But we do have information from Deep State, again, a pro-Ukrainian source, that the Russian forces did achieve some advances to the north of Ivanivsky, which is also just as important in some regards that we're going to get into. So just to map out the particular regions where the Russians are verified to have advanced around, you could say they took over these regions in particular. If I were to mark it in this red perimeter in general. And so let's break it down. First of all, starting with Ivanivsky, the Russian forces have advanced through the center along the T0504 road and have secured full control over uh, Mount Baba as it's referred to by Russian sources. And so this mountain in the red rectangle, you know, there's fortifications around it. It's on a local hill that's overlooking Ivanivsky. And that's also part of the rationale of why the Russian forces over the past couple of days have been launching armored assaults in that direction. The Russian forces were willing to sacrifice several BMDs in an effort to eventually dismount infantry and overrun the Ukrainian defenses in these trenches in an effort to then flank the remaining Ukrainian resistance in western Ivanivsky located on the valley and push them out. And that's something that may have happened depending on whether we get additional verification. By the way, now the Russian forces do have control over this local hill and they have gradually advanced through the open fields in the western direction with the Russian forces more broad goal being to reach the canal district of Chasivyar. So Chasivyar, as you can see, it's a major city to the west of the Donbass Canal. Donbass Canal, I guess I'll mark it in blue for you guys. So you can see the dividing line. And this is very important to understand for the local uh, topography. But Chasivyar is over here. It has a suburb on the eastern side of the canal, which is called the Canal District. And that is Ukraine's largest current defensive node that's still intact to the east of the canal. So there are apartment buildings, industrial facilities. It's an area where you could see the Russians eventually utilizing the FAB 1500s and perhaps the FAB 3000s if those are uh, produced en masse in time for when the Russian forces assault this direction because there are so many fortified structures that the Ukrainian squads will be using to defend and they also have these prepared positions on the outskirts dug in. They have several layers of defense to the east of it. The Russians are now approaching, including adjacent to tree lines. For instance, this one over here or this one over here. And then, of course, it's surrounded by forested regions to the south and to the northeast that, again, the Ukrainians are trying to use to drag out the fighting for as long as possible. So as you can see, here's an elevation map with the red lines indicating the rough line of contact. By virtue of the Russians advancing on Mount Baba and the fields to the north of it, they have now established four positions that are in parity with the Ukrainians' most elevated positions in the canal district and throughout the entire ridge on which the Donbass Canal is located. That's one of the main advantages that the Ukrainians have by withdrawing eventually to the Donbass Canal line. Because that canal line is located on the local heights overlooking various fields. You could say, for instance, the valley on which Ivanivske is located, for instance, or where Bodanivka is located on, or Kromove and Bakhmut. And so now the Russian forces... Their, uh, you could say, initial assault has yielded this control over a field that is finally on parity. And so now the Russian forces, in terms of reconnaissance and firepower, could at least have one area where they're equal, and then assault from there towards the canal district. At the same time, the Russian forces have continued their advances along the red line, which I'll go back to the regular map to show in a second. And by virtue of doing so, they've gotten control over various Ukrainian defensive positions, but also fields that are overlooking Bodanivka from the southern flank. And so the Russians have effectively bypassed the Ukrainian resistance in Bodanivka, which was extremely strong, which prevented the Russians from directly assaulting it, by going around from the south, and now they're putting pressure from that flank as well. Another issue that could be caused if Ivanivske has actually fallen is that we would give the Russians a route from the north to assault the open fields that you could see are located on this red high ground where I'm pointing the arrow towards. And there's a big question as to whether the Ukrainians would have the wherewithal to defend these positions located in open fields, areas that are pretty exposed and disconnected from the main Ukrainian uh, nodes of command and control in the region. And so the Russian forces would have an avenue through which to attack open fields that are located to the west of Chasivyar. So let's go back to the main map to visualize that. So I meant to say Klishivka, and if we entertain the fact that it may have fallen, or Ivanivska, I mean, has fallen, 
then that would mean the Russian forces have an avenue through which to attack southwards and get control over all these open fields that are located on high ground that's overlooking the village of Klishivka. Klishivka is located on a natural valley, and so is Andrivka further to the south around here. And by virtue of the Russians attacking from the western flank, the Ukrainian garrisons in this region, which, again, they don't have very good connection to the main Ukrainian garrison to the east of the, or to the west of the Donbass Canal, they would be exposed. And that could prompt a Ukrainian withdrawal in order to prevent being encircled by the Russian forces. And so the fear would be that if the Russians could continue advancing southwards, the Ukrainian forces would be forced to abandon their current forward positions and at most retreat back, you could say, five kilometers westwards back to the Donbass Canal Line, which as you can see based on the fortification maps, is extremely well built. And of course, it's not just based on the elevation or the defenses, but also the fact that the canal itself is a natural barrier. It does still have some water and it is still located on this uh, little depression. So it will basically try to cross through it. It would create a funnel for any sort of defensive force that notices you. And so really going forward for the Russians in the sector, the goal, which probably will be something they're looking forward to in the future, is how to prompt the Ukrainians to withdraw to the Donbass Canal Line and then to find a suitable area from which to cross over that in order to gain control over an area to the west that is at least on equal elevation to the Ukrainian defenses in Chasivyar that actually are on a very high elevation when you look at the entire region in comparison. So if we go back to over a year ago, the Wagner Group, for instance, they crossed over the canal in an area around Stopochki, Stopochki is over here. They crossed over using the forest, I guess, as cover, you could say, and they fought heavily against the Russia or the Ukraine side in some of these quarries and some of these mines, for instance. And so that's where the Wagner Group was able to advance and hold positions for a pretty long time. And eventually they were pushed back into being overextended and focusing a lot of their wherewithal on the Battle of Bakhmut. And so it'll be interesting to see if the Russians try to take a similar course of action. And as I said before, there is geolocated footage from today showing a Russian assault towards the canal district. There were four vehicles involved. Two of the BMPs and one of the APCs uh, were destroyed by the Ukrainian resistance, which involved artillery targeting those vehicles for a pretty long time until they actually succeeded in getting direct hits. And then after the infantry dismounted in pretty large numbers in some of these open fields, those troops were also targeted by artillery. Then of course there were FEV drones utilized and one of the APCs I believe ran over a mine. And so that should give an idea of the Ukrainian defenses, which were uh, led by the 67th Mechanized Brigade, a unit which I thought was on the Luhansk front, but it appears maybe some of their units or some of their elements were moved to this part of the front line to serve as reinforcements recently. And it also shows us the furthest extent of the Russian assault, which is now based on that footage, only about 700, 600 meters away from the canal district, but also means the Russian forces were able to breach the Ukrainian lines of defense to the east of that area and gain control over certain portions of the built up defenses. Now moving on to Crimea, over the past month we've seen the Ukrainians ramp up efforts to target Russian positions. Um, mainly we're looking at oil refineries for instance, targeting them on the rear pretty deep into Russia using mainly UAVs you could say. A lot of it has been coordinated by Ukraine's main intelligence directorates and that's mainly been going on in Russia proper. You could say for instance in Belgorod, Korsk, but even deeper into Russia. And additionally, they've been try trying to strike at least certain military targets deep into Russia. In this case, this round of strikes that we saw yesterday was on Sevastopol. And so we'll go through some of the information we have available to us. So the main strike that really caught a lot of interest and footage was from the information and computing center of the Russian Black Sea fleets. And so the geolocation for that is around here. And so you had at least three Storm Shadows or the French iteration, the Scalp, EG, and they hit that center for the Black Sea Fleet. It is possible that ever since summer when the Storm Shadows hit the actual Black Sea Fleet headquarters, that some of the assets from that headquarters were moved to this position over here, which could be at least a partial explanation for why the Ukrainians sought out this target. Additionally, the same complex I'm zooming in on right now with all of these uh, you know, orange houses, like the orange roofs you can see over here, that was home at least to the former Ukrainian Black Sea Fleet headquarters. 
and is now currently a communication center, presumably for the Russian 744th communication center. So really this entire complex is inundated with SATCOM antennas and trailers, but in terms of the concrete damage, we can see based on this geolocated footage, there was a direct hit on at least one building in the communication hub. So, you know, you could see the ash from it, of course, the destroyed windows, but there was definitely a direct hit on that building. We don't know yet what was the direct, uh, we don't know what was the damage as a result, like what sort of assets the Russians had in that particular building, but it is still a very important strike in terms of the communication aspect. When we go to look at some of the other reported strikes, there were some that occurred around the Belbek airports. Local sources definitely did report on explosions going around here. But what is not verified is the reports that were coming from Telegram that the Ukrainians managed to damage three Su-27s over here. That's something that is not verified. And given the fact that we're now beginning to see satellite imagery from the results of the strike on Sevastopol that we'll get to in a second, if that actually happened, then I would expect to see that at least. So, you know, that's just something that time will tell about. If we're looking at some of the other strikes, there was one around Kozacha Bay that was reported. Uh, you know, there was fires that were reported by locals over there. And that's also a region where you have the headquarters of the 810th Naval Infantry Brigade. So that was likely the target. And you can see how the Ukrainians in this effort, they tried to not just strike one particular target, but several at the same time in an effort to overwhelm the Russian air defense systems in the region. Additionally, the Ukrainian Strategic Command, they claimed that the Russian project 775 Rapucha class landing ships and they named specifically two of them one named Yamal and the other Azov they claimed that they were able to directly hit them and then of course they mentioned the other claimed damages for instance they claimed that they were able to hit a Russian communication center along with other infrastructure facilities in Sevastopol regarding the Yamal and the Azov that would be around uh, Cape Foylent so actually the strikes occurred in the Sevastopol ports, but there were also explosions reported around Cape Fjolland. If you zoom in, you could see this is the bay where there was actually the targeting. And based on satellite imagery from today, there are four of these Rapucha class landing ships in the area. One of them, which is docked, and that one, there is a scorch mark, which appears to be right next to it on the pier. That's right next to where that ship is docked. And there does appear to be at least some minor damage to that particular ship, which is believed to be the Azov ship. And then there's another ship which is being towed away, but there's no visible damage to it. And there isn't to any of the other ships in the region. And so it does seem, based on that evidence, that those ships could pretty easily be repaired and are still in operation. And meanwhile, to the northeast of Sevastopol, it's reported that there were four explosions in this oil depot facility in the village of Fardiske. And this was likely due to the Ukrainians launching kamikaze drones. Based on the footage that we saw, there were massive smoke plumes and fires that were caused as a result of the collision of those drones with the oil depots. So there was definitely damage caused, although we don't know the specifics as to how many of the canisters were destroyed. Meanwhile, on the night of the 23rd going to the 24th, the Russians continued with their new round of air raids. And this time, the most notable strikes occurred in western Ukraine, especially in Lviv Oblast, around the village of Stri. And here is a really cool map from Monitoring War on Telegram. Of course, all credit to them for making this. But it shows the flight trajectory of the missiles, the cruise missiles that were launched by the Russian side. And then, of course, based on the colors, you can see the labels for all of them. And so you could see how the ones going especially towards western Ukraine, for instance, the ones in red, which would be the KH-101 or 555 uh, cruise missiles. You could see how their course, it takes several turns, especially once it reaches towards the Lviv region. Instead of going directly through Lviv to reach their targets, you could see how in this particular case, one of the cruise missiles actually goes into Polish airspace. And this was again reported by the Polish Ministry of Defense as well, where they claimed that a cruise missile actually crossed over into Polish airspace for 39 seconds. And what the Poles are reporting is that the missile was at an altitude of 400 meters and going at a speed of 800 kilometers an hour. It was able to fly about two kilometers deep into Polish territory 
which did cause activation of two Polish and two American F-16s within Poland. And so then you could see that once the Russians completed their course in Poland, they went and passed the west of Lviv and then hit the target in Stry, which we're going to get to in a second. So that course that was made by the Russian missile is extremely interesting and it occurred around this village over here, Osterdau in Poland. I believe, it, this is my own opinion, but I believe that it has to do with trying to avoid Ukrainian air defense, which may have been concentrated around Lviv and perhaps looking more towards the eastern region, which would be the logical region where you assume that there would be cruise missiles launched towards Lviv, for instance, directly from the east. So it appears it was an attempt to bypass some of the defenses. And then we saw that they went further south and attacked towards the Ukrainian installations within this village three. And for instance, there were some explosions reported around this uh, Strisky aerodrome. And so this is a very interesting place to attack because if you look at the length of the runway, it's about 2.5 kilometers, which is 8,200 feet. And for F-16s, you need a runway of at least 5,000 feet for those to be conducive for the F-16 fighter jets. And so it does appear like once the Ukrainians do receive the F-16s, this would be a likely place for them to initially be stationed because it is just so close to the border with Poland. And so they would likely be transferred through this area and could be launched from this area. So there may be some preparations that are being set up by the Ukrainian uh, Air Force in this region for such an arrival. And according to all sources involved, like the Russian sources, there isn't any sort of F-16 in Ukrainian territory, but they do claim, at least this is the Russian side's claim, that they were able to disrupt any sort of Ukrainian installations last night in their strikes on this territory. We don't have any concrete video footage from ground zero of those strikes. We do know that it was reported around this village three that there were 10 to 20 explosions. And some of those occurred to the north of the village. One such area that was actually recorded on camera. There were three pretty interesting videos showing strikes. And then, of course, secondary fires that were caused due to the Russian strike on a gas compressor station, which is located over here if you zoom in. And so there are a lot of Ukrainian gas facilities in this region, which, again, is a part of... Russia's broader strategy that we've seen over the past couple of days of targeting energy infrastructure in Ukraine in a way they haven't done over the past year. Really, what as I said before, it's going to be interesting to see how there are differences between this current bombing campaign versus the one from March of last year. And for instance, yesterday it was also reported that there were power outages in an area like Kriviri, but we didn't really get specific information as to Russian strikes. Same thing around Kharkiv. So it is interesting to see whether the Russians also did target those regions or whether it's just continued rolling blackouts. But the most interesting event of all is regarding this underground gas storage facility. The Bilche Volitsko Oherske underground gas storage facility is the largest of its kind in Ukraine and the second largest in all of Europe. It makes up 50% of Ukraine's gas storage with uh, a capacity of holding up to 17 billion cubic meters of natural gas and that is like 50 percent because the ukrainians have a capacity of 31 billion and so something very interesting about this facility is that yeah i would expect some of that to be ukraine's own natural gas but over the past year alone in 2023 you, you european firms actually sent 2.5 billion cubic meters of their own gas into the storage facility and into other ones within Ukraine. And that's mainly done because there is more availability within these Ukrainian facilities and because of lower operating costs like to pay the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are trying to make it better for businesses to go and send their gas into this region, for instance, by not raising tariffs on such uh, imports going into 2025. And so what's really going to be interesting is to see if the Russians did or will in the future target this facility or maybe some of its supporting infrastructure. For instance, we know for sure there was targeting of the gas compressor station nearby, especially now that we know for sure that the Ukrainians are not going to renew the deal that they made with Gazprom. There was a deal signed in 2019 between the Ukrainian state and Gazprom that were wherein the Russians basically paid the Ukrainians in order to allow them to export their natural gas through Ukrainian pipelines into Europe. And so now the Ukrainians have made clear that 
they're going to let it expire on the tw on December 2024. And so at that point, there will be no Russian uh, ability to move their natural gas through the Ukrainian side and then into Europe itself. And so it will be very, very, very interesting to see what the Russians end up trying to do, what sort of course of action they take regarding the Ukrainian underground gas storage facilities, if they really are serious about degrading the Ukrainian energy infrastructure. And so that's all I have for today. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.